Hey, hey, hey there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to another Red Pill Religion podcast. Red Pill Religion, amongst the things that we say are that uh, belief in the supernatural and the transcendent are normal, healthy, rational, and evidence-based. So if you like the kind of content we make here, please support our work on redpillreligion.com, redpillreligion.com, where every day we've got new articles and videos and and other good stuff like that check out on the right sidebar we we really enjoy your bitcoin and your paypal donations you can also find us on subscribe star please find us on subscribe star and note that we do indeed have some cool uh, merchandise for sale which we'll also have linked in the low bar and on the blog and uh in the comments to this video so please do check us out and please tell your friends or enemies give us a like give us a subscribe and uh, tonight, as usual on Mondays for now, we are joined by science fiction writer and fantasy writer John C. Wright. Say hello, John. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And everybody be sure to visit scifiwrite.com where you can click on the works section to buy all of his fabulous fiction. Um, much of it award nominated and award winning. Uh, and of course, you get free stuff on the blog every day. Uh, uh, in fact, I see that John wrote a little essay for us uh, for today. Uh, the link doesn't work, John, but you, we got a little essay for us. Do you get any free fiction this week first, though? Yes, but my free fiction comes up on Wednesday. Uh, so it used to always show up the first thing whenever you and I would do a talk when we talked on Wednesday. So oh, I that's could, right. Uh, I could change my schedule and post it every Monday, but still. Excellent, excellent. Well, so the, the next chapter of Lost in the Last Continent is up, and it's uh, I'm actually moving into the the dramatic uh, climax of that uh, four volume epic. I actually have four four novels worth of material up on the uh, on the blog on that weekly story that I'm doing, and after I'm done with that, I'm going to move on to something else. Awesome. All right, and so everybody, please be sure to check out uh, SciFiWrite.com. And also be sure to uh, visit eljajilamplighter.com, which Eljaji Lamplighter is Mrs. Wright uh, in real life. Now tonight, uh, we're going to be talking, uh, John and I are going to be talking about the subject of what Owen Benjamin, I think, rightly calls wizardry. Um, and uh, uh, John's phrase is warlocks and more locks. I like it. I'm going to go ahead and read this bit of, of prose by Mr. Wright. You have been living in the Matrix, which told you that religion is a crass and backward superstition, hostile to silence, irrational and unhygienic, which has no place in the future. Now, you can either take the blue pill and wake up believing whatever you want to believe, or you can take the red pill and have the scales fall from your eyes, shed your blindness, and see the world as it is. The left has been using your brain as a battery, a lump met only to power their schemes and schemas. Take the red red pill and discover that religion is rational is based on evidence and healthy is healthy and is normal this week the topic is warlocks and morlocks or how systematic manipulations of words and their meanings makes english into newspeaks join us on the chat begins at 8 p.m live spontaneous to, and unscripted uh, here we go all right i'm going to i'm going to adjust that to opening time <laughs> to our real time thanks to the gremlins that have plagued our uh our happy uh, little little podcast here. I want to link, make the link actually work too while let, you're at it. Yep. Let me uh, let me tell you why belief in the supernatural is is reasonable and evidence based. The word gremlin to refer to the supernatural beings that mess up complex technology did not exist until at least the first world war, where the little things that messed up the air the uh, the pr first primitive airplanes, creatures that drank gasoline and cut wires were unleashed from the spirit world, from the elfish world, into the human world. So, if superstition was merely something that non-technological people invented and ran with, why would a technological race like the uh, like the English of World War I uh, come up with the idea of gremlins, I ask you? I'm not saying one way or the other, I'm just saying, I ask you. I, you know, I, I don't even know if the audience knows what gremlins are, to be gremlins honest. Gremlins are the critters strong. that mess up technology, that, that, that take apart gears, that drink gasoline, and that make it so that airplanes crash. They're the little, uh, the little uh, yeah. bugs that uh, get into your system. They're the things that make it so your computer crashes when you've got a podcast to do. One of my uh, one of my one of my favorite uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons involves a gremlin during World War II. 
But uh, yeah, the gremlins are, you've heard the phrase before, and I'm sure you've seen the movie, but gremlins go back many generations, I don't know how many, to, you know, mechanics and repairmen and uh, electrical engineers and even computer guys, and they'll all say the yeah. same things. Things start messing up for no explicable reason. It's supernatural creatures called gremlins. And that uh, movie had nothing to do with real gremlins. While no. those gremlins in the movie were clever with their hands and could put machinery together, that's not what the mythology uh, says that they're supposed to do. So, you know, don't don't take anything out of Hollywood uh, as gospel. When it comes yeah, to no. Mythology. It, when, 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 when Hollywood messes with mythological properties, 95% of the time, I would assert, they mess it up completely. Even yeah. Disney does. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, all, all, all that aside. They get, so, they, now, now, be fair to Disney, they get some things right. The Seven Dwarves, of course, are the same creatures as the Schwarzelfheim from Wagner's Magnificent Opera, <laughs> the, ring, the, ring, uh, the Ring Cycle. Because they live underground and they're busily, busily at work uh, 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 delving for jewels, gems, and metals. And, of course, they'll work for Alborek. So, there we go. I mean, all that stuff, that's, that's all, the, all the dwarves you saw in uh, Sleeping Beauty. Excuse me, belay that, not Sleeping Beauty. Snow White. That's straight from Germanic uh, mythology. Unchanged. He just made him cuter. You know, he just made him cute. So, but... That's not our topic tonight, so I'm sorry to have distracted us already. That's all right. We're going to talk about the subject of neuro-linguistic programming, uh, uh, which we have talked about and touched upon before. Um, there's all kinds of uh, uh, stuff that you can go online to look up on, on, on how to do it and what it's all about. Um, I follow a lot of people who believe that uh, going back for decades now, advertisers and even just regular uh, TV and movie uh, writers have been slowly injecting messages more and more into the culture to change our language and change our way of thinking and change our assumptions. And the general uh, phrase people who talk about this use is neuro-linguistic programming. But uh, perhaps you could tell us more about it, and more to the point, how to recognize it and combat it. Well, here's what's odd about the whole thing. The guy who originally uh, made it up is, is a, uh, is a uh, scientist, a thinker, a philosopher named Alfred Korzybski. And he was big in the 1930s when his native Austria was slowly being taken over by the fascists. It, it was before the war, but his there was a fascist party in Austria as well as in Germany. And he could see that merely by phrasing certain words and phrases and certain concepts, presenting them in a certain way, dressing them, if you will, in a different coat of words, that people could be as if hypnotized, psychologically conditioned to react a certain way to, uh, to the words without actually engaging their uh, their cortex, their their rash, their reason to examine uh, to see if their emotional reaction, their unthinking emotional reaction, was true to facts or false to facts, was legitimate or illegitimate, was a, a product of what would naturally occur to them, or was a product of manipulation. Now, when he studied this, he was he was trying to make an attempt to uh, combat systematic scientific propaganda which did not really exist before the modern age. I mean, obviously, there have always been poets who wrote praises of kings, and there's always been people who wrote uh, persuasive rhetoric. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about deliberately attempting to bypass the reason and only strike at the heart, only get the people have a, a unthinking emotional reaction, instantaneous emotional reaction. Now, here's one problem with his study. His study was not exactly a science. It was more of a pseudoscience, but there was still a lot of good rules of thumb and common sense involved in what he did, okay? And some insights that were actually quite striking, one of which you can sum up by saying, the map is not the territory, the word is not the thing it represents. In fact, I can see that in, your, in, your, uh, in the uh, Wikipedia article, they quote that. What that means is that the words you're using to represent reality to yourself are not necessarily... Uh, linked to the reality, that there's, that there's a, a gap between 
the words you use in your mind to think about reality and the reality itself. And if you're unaware of that gap, then you're going to mistake uh, the connotation of the word for something that's really happening in reality. Let me use the example that I used last time we, we talked about this on your on your podcast. Uh, Korzybski once uh, uh, had a lecture where he was uh, pretended to be hungry and he brought out some some crackers to eat. And he asked if anyone in the front row of the audience uh, also was hungry and wanted one. And he passed them out. And then when he pulled the the cracker uh, container out of his coat, it had the word dog biscuit written on it. Now, the physical properties of the thing they were putting in their mouth had not changed from one moment to another. But the moment they thought it was a dog biscuit, they began to get physically si sick. One of the guys had to leave the room to go puke, okay? Now... What causes a physiological reaction in relation to something that's merely a verbal connotation? You see, because to him, the word dog biscuit meant something that humans allowed to eat, something that was not healthy for humans, something that was viscerally disgusting. But of course, nothing really had changed. I mean, uh, Krasinski was playing a trick on these guys. He wasn't actually feeding them dog food, right? Now, keep all that in mind. After his, after he uh, passed away, uh, a guy named uh, Hayakawa in uh, California also started studying the relationship between words and our psychological reaction to word to word meanings, and he called this neurolinguistics. And neurolinguistic program neuro because it's your nervous system reaction, and linguistic because they react to the words. And he noticed that people could be programmed that is to say could be habituated to have certain responses. To certain words, uh, if you if you set about it systematically, scientific propaganda, in other words. Now, this power can be used for good or for evil. For example, there's a writer called Harold Robbins. Excuse me, not Harold Robbins. Believe that Tony Robbins, who writes self help books for uh, people who want to get ahead in business or people who want to break themselves yeah. into a habit and so on. He's Awaken kind of like the a giant within and all that stuff. Yes, yeah. yes. Awaken the giant within. That's the guy. Now, I'm not going to dismiss him as a crackpot because, for one thing, when I read one of his books, it actually inspired me to change jobs to a better job. But all he was doing was teaching people how to advertise to themselves the same way the Coca-Cola company advertises its product to you to, to, so that you had the power to persuade yourself to do something you otherwise would be reluctant or unable to do. See? Basically, it was kind of a, a form of auto-hypnosis. A form of lying to yourself, or not not lying. I'm, that sounds too sinister. A type of pep talk, effective pep talks to yourself, so you could be your own best cheerleader rather than your own worst critic. And I think everyone in the audience kind of knows what I mean by cheerleader versus critic. But the Coca-Cola company is not trying to get you to screw your courage to the sticking place to get a better job or to get ahead in life or to break that bad habit you have of smoking or drinking or what have you, they're trying to get you to buy their product. And so they use the same kind of thinking, the same kind of neurolinguistic programming, the same kind of psychological subtlety to manipulate the public that Hayakawa was talking about and that he had seen the Nazis using to put across their opinions. And of course, not only do political parties, but the entire uh, panorama of the philosophy uh, uh, of the left, uh, the uh, the philosophy of progressivism depends heavily on masking their true meaning in order to make their unpalatable uh, conclusions right. seem palatable. Now, I'll say one other thing about this, and I hope I'm not talking too long. <laughs> the the economist um, uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises was one of the very few economists who supported and defend the laissez-faire free market at a time when all of the intellectuals in the West, everyone was just totally enamored with this new scientific theory called socialism. Now, anyone who has studied socialism at, at close at hand knows it's just a crock. It's just a crackpot thing. And von Mises proved in an argument that I think has never been refuted or even seriously addressed by the socialists, that under a socialist a form of uh, economics, you cannot have what's called economic calculation. You can't tell how what what any good or service is worth because you can't break down the components of the good or service into the price structure because under socialism you don't have prices 
All you have is priorities, which are set by the central government. Before anyone objects, let me just say, the way Russia, at the height of Stalinism, set the prices for their goods, which they set by committee, was not by weighing and balancing the various needs of the various individuals involved or finding out what they would have preferred. They looked at the West and borrowed the price structure from the West, and they charged the same that someone in France would have paid for the same good. That's how they set the prices. It's completely arbitrary. In a free market, of course, you set the prices by the sum total of all the decisions of all the members of the, of the market as to what they want to buy and what they don't want to buy. If, if, if beans are more important than, than corn, the price of beans will go up as there's more demand and the price of corn will go down. So, now, one of the other things that Mises, von Mises pointed out, which I think is also devastating to Marx, and for all the philosophies that spring out of Marx, and I include progressivism as a Marxist offshoot, is the idea of word fetishes. Well, von Mises pointed out that all Marx did is he didn't invent any single new economic theory. All he did was propose economic ideas that had previously been examined in the generations prior to him and had been exploded. He was taking old ideas that had already been thought through and shot down by sober uh, economists and wrote them up in a single coherent kind of structure. He repackaged them, okay? But what he did is he just used language to call good things by bad names and bad things by good names. So instead of saying uh, earning a wage, he used the word wage slavery. He didn't ever describe what it is about earning a wage that's bad for the guy earning the wage, who, after all, does get the wages he was promised if he, he's not being cheated. He just asserted that it was wage slavery, that it was just as bad as being forced to be compelled to work without getting any wage. So, in fact, he just used a term that means the exact opposite of what the term meant to refer to the thing, like pointing at a, pointing at a, a, a night sky and saying, that's noon. And uh, he would make up phrases like ideological superstructure to refer to the philosophy of uh, the West that supported human liberty, including the liberty of the marketplace. And instead of answering any of the criticisms of any sober economists or any uh, uh, diligent defenders of human liberty, he merely asserted he merely labeled them, he merely called that an ideological superstructure, which he said sprang from their uh, uh, conditioning of caused by their, their means of production. That the uh, hand mill, for example, created the Middle Ages and the factory created the capitalist world. Okay. Uh, now, the question of how, how in the world could he get away with something that was such a ridiculous and obvious trick, such an obvious falsehood? Well, the answer is, it's not obvious, because when you're talking to someone, you don't normally stop and say, please define your terms. No one but really annoying lawyers and really, really annoying philosophers does that. And usually when they do, the conversation breaks down because most definitions are not something you can put into words. They're built up by your experience. Every time you've heard a certain word or a certain phrase, it feeds into your mind with, with a dozen other times it's been used or a million other images or, or ideas that you've had in relation to it. So the way to psychologically manipulate a man or a group of men or a society is merely to take certain words or ideas or images and associate them with other concepts, not the natural ones to which they rightly and correctly belong, but to false ones, what we call false effects association. If you look at something like baby murder, if you look at infanticide, a mother giving birth to a child and taking it out into the woods, putting it on a rock and waiting for the buzzards to eat it, you have kind of a visceral negative reaction. But if the same act is referred to as a woman's right to choose, or even a woman's health issue, I mean, the, the natural instinct of all red-blooded males is to try to protect women and to protect their health, and the natural instinct of all red-blooded females is to, is to act in their own self-regard in, in order to preserve themselves. But nothing has changed if you, if you talk about a, a baby, let's say, one minute inside the womb and one minute outside the womb. They're not physically different any more than the cracker used in the lecture by, by Dr. Kwasinski was physically different in anyone's mouth. All they do is use a different word. They call it a dog biscuit, and you associate that in your mind with all the filthy things you've ever seen a dog eat on your kitchen floor, <laughs> and, and you think it's not good for you. So you, you, you're revolted. 
You're, you're disgusted at a pre-conscious level. It's an instinctive reaction that has been inst – instinct is not technically the right word. It's a habituated reaction that's been conditioned into you just like Pavlov's dogs were conditioned to salivate at the sound of a ringing bell. So, so whenever someone says to you, women's health issue, the natural reaction of anyone who's been properly conditioned by the, by the wizards, by the warlocks who are doing a magic spell on you, is you're going to go, yay, I'm in favor of that. Now, as I've said before, this has two drawbacks. Once you have a false effects association resting unquestioned in your mind, the problem is that if you think of, uh, if you call a bad thing by a good name, a euphemism, or you call a good thing by a bad name, I don't know what you would call that, a cacophonism, a swear word, a slander word. If you refer to the free market as capitalism, or if you refer to uh, the nightmarish uh, slave states of the Soviet Union as the workers' paradise, then you've got a false defect association going on in your mind. Yeah. And whenever anyone argues with you, if you let's say you're in favor of infanticide, but only because, because and only because you call it right to choose. Now, half the people in the audience are going to say, well, infanticide is bad. Therefore, I am against the right to choose. I believe we should take choice away. I would like to have tyranny instead. That's healthier. <laughs> well, you see how stupid that sounds? Well, but, the other, but the only other option of the, of, the, of the horns of the dilemma is to go, oh, no, no, I'm in favor of the right to choose. Therefore, let us pile up the baby skulls like Aztecs did. Okay? That's, that's if anything, even worse. By, by creating a false to facts association there, by tying a good concept into a bad concept, or wage slavery. If you're against wage slavery, that you either have to say, well, we should get rid of wage slavery and just have everyone work for the government. Or you say, well, I'm in favor of wage slavery right. and every other form of slavery as well, if it's a good thing. You see, you see how it works? You see how it goes? I do see how it goes, although uh, we, we've certainly gone far afield, and I sort of want to argue with you because I think conservatives and libertarians and free market people do the same thing when they say words like free trade and competition and free markets when they, in fact, all of those things were used uh, to uh, basically turn most of our economy over to large corporations who are not free market entities at all. So I think a lot of neurolinguistic programming comes out of a lot of libertarians who talk that way and won't. Why? Why, why do you think I'm uh, going to disagree with that? Yeah, I don't know that you would. I've, I, it's been it's been something that's been bothering me for some years now, and I've only just well, here's here, to but I would, I would say I would say there's a difference between the two of them. Uh -huh. I would say that Marx and everything that springs out of him, and I assert that all progressivism springs out of Marx, has to be false to facts by its very nature because their entire philosophy rests on the idea that words are arbitrary labels that you use to manipulate people to get your to get your way so that's, let's, that's at the core that's at the core of their philosophy now let's go so back. lying is lying wait, let me finish my sentence lying is at the core of their philosophy at the very heart of it now there are liars who oppose them who are who are people who are conservatives or on the right or traditionalists who do say propaganda things to support their point of view, but they're not. But lying is not essential to them. Those people could tell the truth if they wished, and could say, as you just did, a true free market does not give a corporation undue political power in a in a free market, and could also say just because the free market doesn't mean it's a good thing. No Christian would say that because no Christian should support a free market in uh, slaves or drugs or pornography or wives, okay? Well, Those things are against the Christian religion. Well, yeah. Without getting without getting too much into the politics though, let's uh, let's back up and let's start talking about some uh, everyday examples of how people use this this sort of thing. Uh, one of one of them, for example, is I've noticed this ro ero this this word erosion shift where it, it, and this goes back to what we often talk about too. The word religion has been redefined to mean something irrational um, <laughs> and, and and something illogical and something that is not evidence-based and something that is dangerous. Right, right. And the word atheist has been redefined to mean lack of belief and, and, and just sort of to be assumed as the default position in humans. Right. And so right. you'll even hear people do this little phrase as, I'm not religious. I don't think being religious makes you bad. I don't bad or good. I don't think being an atheist makes you bad or good. But no one ever killed in the athe name of atheism and, pe and, and religion, you know, 
I don't want religious people imposing their values. It's all a word game, right? Because the atheist, all the, word game. the progressive, Let me tell never you. wants to admit that he has morals, he has values, and he is as religious as the next man. Uh, I, I agree in part and disagree in part. I agree with everything you said, but disagree with the reason you gave. The reason that thing that makes it all a word game, it, it's all a spell. It's all a hypnosis. It's all neurolinguistic uh, programming. It's all someone trying to program your brain at a subconscious pre-verbal level. You're trying to bypass your reason and sneak past the sleeping guardians of your thought to get at your heart before you know what's going on is, here's why. No one ever proved that religion was irrational. No one ever sat down with a with a uh, a, a crate of evidence and a experiment and showed that it was irrational. What they did is they told stories where every time a religious character came on stage, that guy was irrational. That's all they did. See, or they they did it through the culture. They yep. used the word religion and the word irrational in the same sentence over and over again. They used yeah. the word religion as if religion was the opposite of science, which it is not, obviously, any more than it's the opposite of piano tuning. Okay? But, I mean, the idea that there's a war between religion and piano tuning is absurd. So why do people believe there's a war between religion and science? Well, no one ever said such a thing. They never proved such a thing. They just wrote a play about Galileo where everyone in the play acted as if the central conflict was between the evil religion and the good scientist. A scientist who, by the way, was not necessarily correct about all of his scientific assertions. The tides are not caused by the spinning of the earth, for example. But do you see what I'm saying? Do you see where I'm going with this? The thing that makes it neurolinguistic programming is not that you have certain word games living in your brain that you've never questioned, you've never swept out and seen where they come from. It's that they were smuggled in by the back door. Oh, yeah. You see? Now, if someone has persuaded you, has given you a reasonable argument and historical evidence to show why, for example, uh, the U.S. Constitution is a better legal document than the, uh, the way they ran France after the French Revolution, that's a rational belief. Or if someone's talked you into a scientific belief, if you believe in the expanding universe as opposed to the, the uh, Big Bang as opposed to the steady state theory. That's a, that's a scientific belief that someone presented evidence to you. But if someone, every time he said the word women, showed you, portrayed a woman as evil, wicked, bitchy, adulteress who were busily stabbing children to death with knives, and you never saw any woman portrayed in an attractive, alluring, romantic way, after a while, the word itself would get an instinctive reaction to you from you as instinctive as if you thought a cookie was a dog biscuit, even though nothing has changed about the biscuit but the word. Right, right. And that's how these guys do it. They do it the same way the Coca-Cola company persuades you to drink liquid sugar, you know, just by showing you an image of who knows what, who cares, a dancing polar bear, something pleasant, you know, Michael Jackson red jacket. As you can see, I'm talking about commercials from 40 years ago. To be honest with you. Company, has been around a long time. <laughs> Young people don't watch TV anymore, uh, shocking as that is. I mean, there was a reason they always called it TV programming. I, I, I really believe that. I mean, uh, they still have media. They still watch. But the same people who are behind it put their ads elsewhere. Why do you think they're so, they're, they're so frantically trying to uh, get censorship controls in place for the Internet? And, and ex ex want to exclude people from Twitter and from, uh, uh, you know, Facebook and so on. I, I, and, I, I, and disproportionately, they're trying to exclude people on, on my side of the spectrum. Why do you think that is? Uh, Justin Johnson points out that we watch YouTube and Netflix, and actually it winds up being the same thing because there's, there, there's programming embedded in every, every Netflix show you watch. <laughs> There's going to be, there's programming embedded in a, in a lot of the popular YouTube channels because if you have the proper talking points they get in, you, you get to be popular on YouTube. And if you don't, you don't get to be popular on YouTube. I mean, the atheist movement has, for example, especially on YouTube, uh, got all these phrases, you know, that, that, that there are neuro linguistic programming phrases um, that they do indoctrinate their followers with and do put in their videos. I'll give you a few. May I? May I give you a few? Certainly, if you let me do one first, the word diversity, okay. what's it actually mean? 
Diversity, yeah, well, I'm, uh, I, I, I can't do it at the moment. A bunch of different things at once. You have lots of something. <laughs> you have lots of variety. There's, there's diversity. Have you ever, uh, have, have you ever heard you use the word in any context where it had a negative connotation? Yeah. I've, I've been tortured by a great diversity of torture instruments. No, because it has a special neurolinguistic programming meaning. And it's used a certain way to get a certain effect. But pardon me for interrupting. You, you were gonna, you were gonna say your. Well, I'll, I'll give a few, but I'll give you one of my favorites. It's called. Ahead, it's something they've popularized called Hitchens's razor, and it's the dumbest, most dishonest phrase ever. And I hear it all the time now. That which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Which at uh, first is an almost impossible phrase to respond to until you realize it's an unphrase that means nothing. Um, um, and furthermore, cannot uh, prove itself by, its, by is, its own rule. Well, it how, is it, how is it different from saying that in logic, whatever is gratuitously asserted can be gratuitously denied? That's actually a principle of logical reasoning. Um, when you say, because when they use the phrase, they use it to describe things for which there is evidence, amongst other things. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. In other words, yeah, in let, other let's words, say you say, you, you say something, anything at all, make any assertion at all. Uh, my eyes, you know, my, my wife is 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 lovely. I say that which is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And you it's like very, uh, you make a very good point because neurolinguistic programming, while it is deceptive to its core, does not depend on literal deception. Correct. Every word in the sentence, whatever is asserted without evidence can be denied without evidence, is correct. That's that's a principle. That's a legal principle of evidence. Okay. I know. I know. But. If you only ever hear someone use it in arguments relating to dismissing religious assertions, then you be, then the the uh, programming oh, yeah. convinces you that religion rests on faith rather than on evidence. I've seen so, Hitchens yeah. acolytes not only use that. First off, it's always a conversation stopper, and it's always a, a cheap way to flipping the thing around. So it's like, oh, you, you know, like I have to prove something to you. Um, uh, and and in, it's, in law, it, in law I, we call that in law we call that shifting the burden of proof, where I'm the prosecutor and I have to prove my case to you, and you suddenly say, "Well, there's no evidence on your side either," and so suddenly I'm on the defensive as if you're the prosecutor. Yeah, that's that that that's how the little game works. I mean, I've seen it used for all kinds of things. Uh, you know, it, it's actually a, I've even seen it used to prejudice someone to make it look like they have no evidence. They haven't even been asked for any yet, and you say that right. which can be you know. And, and again, and again, let me emphasize that it's not something that people are talked into. All that happens is people use a certain phrase and repeat it over and over again in the same circumstances so that it becomes subconsciously associated in the minds of the audience with that circumstance. So the word diversity is always used as if it's something good, they think of it as good. The, the, the evidence claim is always used in, in a situation where they're assuming there's no evidence. So it's always used, they think, as a conversation stopper. Even though it's not, all it is is a demand for evidence. It's like saying, you know, give me a citation, please. Yeah, well, it? but people don't know how to respond to it because there's not an easy answer to it. I finally figured it out. I'm like, you know, you 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 flip it back. You say, well, evidence has been offered. What's wrong with the evidence? Yeah. Or you yeah. know, I mean, what? Please specify what you will accept. What you mean by evidence, and but, what you will accept is evidence. Here is the, but here is the sinister thing about no matter what your answer is, they don't care. Because all they're trying to do is to build up the association. Every time you bring out dog food, you ring the bell. So whenever the dog is hungry yep. and he hears the bell, he salivates. They even want to it doesn't snack matter. Him. It doesn't yep. matter whether he eats the food at that point or not. The association between the bell and the food is built up. Every time you use the word right to choose, you're talking about infanticide. But you never use the word infanticide. You never even show a picture of what the procedure looks like. Because okay? that might change someone's mind. All you do is you, you simply say the same thing over and over again, either in a positive light or a negative light, and it conditions the audience to react like a like a Pavlov dog. That's what yeah. realistic programming is. Well, let me try this one and, and, and see, see if you have a, uh, instead of a good response, give, an, uh, give a regular response. There is no evidence for God. Uh, the average person that responds. I can tell you, I can tell you what my response is. Yeah. In in logic, a gratuitous assertion can be gratuitously denied. If you make an assertion for which there's no evidence, such as the assertion that there's no evidence to God, I can, without evidence, assert that the opposite. 
Oh, I'm going to remember that one. Wait a minute. A gratu a gratu Touché. All of these things boomerang back on the person who's saying them because all of them are like the idiot gardener who sits on the branch he's busily sawing that. off. I want to repeat that because that was good phrasing. Uh, a, 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 what? <laughs> a what? How did you put it? A, a what? In logic, a gratuitous assertion. Gratuitous means offered without evidence. Can be gratuitously denied. A gratuitous assertion can be gratuitously denied. Yes, we have right. evidence. Sorry. Anything anything you offer without evidence can be denied without evidence. So if you offer without evidence the statement, there's no evidence for God, then I don't need to offer any evidence to say, sure there is. Fall back sure. in your court, buddy. Produce your evidence now. Produce your evidence that there's no evidence for God. Show me. I'm from Missouri. You see the problem? You see why they use the methods they use and why they always change the topic whenever you ask them a real question? Yep. These guys are very elusive and very elliptical. And the reason is they're not trying to argue with you. Nope. They're trying to make it look like they're arguing so they can associate, so they can ring the bell and bring out the dog at the same time. So they can you, know have how, you know how the game works, too. You say something like, there is no evidence for God. And somebody says something like, well, well what about uh, name anything? The immediate answer the is universe. that's not evident. Yeah. The, the immediate the answer is, that's not evidence. I mean, it, literally, that's the not moral evidence. Nature, the moral nature of man. That's not evidence. The logical need for an uncaused first cause. That's not evidence. I could just do it all day. <laughs> they play this. They play this all the time. That's not, it's called the, the, the evidence game. Atheist right. says, give me some evidence. You provide some evidence. They say, that's not evidence. I don't accept that as evidence. And the, and, yeah. and the left generally does this also for anything, where if you say, but I read a history book that says, and they go, oh, well, that history book's propaganda. And then you say, well, a study goes, and they go, oh, no, no, those aren't real scientists. Those, those, are, those, are, those are crackpots. You know, and they, for, their, for their global warming hoax, for example, they have to generate tremendous amounts of proof for all, and anything that's scientifically evidential, such as the melting of the ice caps on Mars. <laughs> I'm sorry, the melting of the ice caps on Mars cannot be caused by anthropocentric, by by the escape of greenhouse gases on Earth. It's not possible. It has to do with how much heat the sun's putting out. They just deny it. They say, oh, no, no, it never happened. And, I, and if you say, well, NASA says it happened, they go, well, NASA, you know, they don't count. <laughs> well, the, the, let me see. We have, we're having a little interesting conversation in the chat. I'll, 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 I'll read it here, too, because Utopia Blaster makes a good point. He says, doesn't calling it programming give it an unacceptable connotation as well, since no one is going to believe they can be programmed? Wouldn't neurolinguistic psychology be better? Well, maybe. Although I would notice, as I've mentioned before, we've accepted the word programming um, as a form of entertainment for decades now. And I, I, I actually do wonder if that then, itself was a little I, I, I think you make it, I think you make a good point. And you show a nice awareness of the fact that the word has a connotation which may or may not be deserved. Because the people who made this up, including Korzybski and Hayakawa, uh, bought into the modern psychological model of how the human soul works. That model, by the way, is just a theory and does not seem to have uh, all that much evidence to back it. It's basically self-referential, you, you know. So their language make, gives, the reason why I called it a pseudoscience rather than a science is because their language always, the, the language they use for describing this is clinical. I'm a poet, I would rather use poetic language. I will, and I'm a science fiction writer, so I'll use science fiction language. What they're doing is newspeak. What they're doing is Orwellian newspeak from Orwell's 1984, where they use some word that has no meaning and referring it to, to uh, uh, and giving it a meaning that, that doesn't deserve, it doesn't, doesn't carry, okay? Right, right. I, I I agree. Although I'm I'm still you you bring up the left a lot, and there's people on the right or called the, the globalist right, right. Who I have the, the globalist right. right. You know the corporatist globalist right, who are really what they call how, neocons. And, and how how are they on the how are they on the right? They're on the left. Well, I guess it depends on what what is, what does left and right means. Well, I've uh, left means we may not agree right politically means, on this, right but means. I think but I, I walked away from both libertarianism and and the Republican Party because I got sick of hearing the words free trade, which I knew was a lie, and uh, competition, which I knew was a lie, and free markets, uh, which I knew to be a lie, coming out of Republican mouths. 
and 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 libertarian mouths. Um, but because really, I, I I don't think most of our free trade agreements were free trade agreements, and I don't think most corporate capitalism is free market at all. No, no. Um, nor does nor does anyone I know who calls himself a conservative. Really? Well, okay. I mean, I've I, I certainly had years of listening to conservatives talking that way, which is why I walked away from a lot of them. But it does seem well, to be uh, changing. That's, that's uh, why a lot of conservatives want to walk away from Republicans for exactly that for exactly that reason. Yeah, the yeah. Republicans and, did not did not serve the uh, the uh, the conservative movement. Very well. I, I but again, but again, what's going on even in this conversation is you and I are using the words with slightly different connotations, and so we're talking across purposes. Yeah, we're probably talking about the same group of people. Say, but one world government has always been a daydream of the progressives. Way back, way back to Woodrow Wilson, who's who's the only guy who can legitimately be called a progressive. The word is kind of uh, past its sell-by date by now. I, but this is not this is not a political blog. This is a religion blog. So a, I don't want to get involved. Yeah, a, a person I used to deal with a lot, and you know, a professor Kaninen, um once made the case that. Of uh, the entire field, uh, who's a uh, Kaninen is a is a philosopher. Used to be a Nietzschean, now is a Plato, Pla, Pla, Plato, Platonist. Uh, Platonist, thank you. Platonist. Um, and because uh, figured out theirs was a god, but um, the what the point? What what is the? Uh, shoot, my mind is going blank. What is the word for? the comparatively modern philosophical thing where you are defining your, what words mean. Oh my God. Why can't I? Epistemology. Thank you. Epistemology. Uh, that's not, no, 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 uh, no, wrong. Epistemology is ancient. It's the science of studying how human knowledge works. Okay. People who define their own words is called nominalism. Nominalism. And that goes back to the middle ages. And many people, including me, think that's where people started, go, Western philosophy started going wrong. The nominalist, believes that, the nominalist believes that a word is an absolutely arbitrary label that you merely stick on an object in reality and that you are free to switch the labels around in any way, shape, and way shape you, uh, uh, that you mean. The uh, realist, so it's an awkward term, but that's what the technical term is, believes that uh, words and symbols have an innate structural reality to them that has a natural relationship to the objects that they're supposed to represent. So... Uh, Korzybski is a is a nominalist, which is why he spoke in a clinical fashion about this witchcraft we're talking about. The word witchcraft, by the way, is a much clearer word and has a much better connotation for what people are trying to do to you, because they're trying to mesmerize you. They're trying to hypnotize you with their word use, with their connotations. I'll tell you, uh, man. So, anyway, uh, so Christians believe that words come from God and that Christ is logos, which is a Greek word that means word. The word was God and the word was with God. Uh, that poetry has a deeper meaning than just arbitrary word sounds. After the nominalists took over, the, the, the poetry in the West became uh, freeform, unrhyming, uh, uh, abstract, and it went the same way that abstract, cubist, and non-representational painting went. It became a uh, study only for a very small and elite group that, that, that lost, its, uh, lost its roots in the, in the common, in the common uh, culture. Does that make sense what I'm saying, or is that too far away? Yeah, they, uh, is. I guess, I, you know, I guess I've been derailed on what my thought was, but in general, endless arguing over definitions is probably the... Semantics big, is the word you're looking for. Is, ...is constantly... It is the destroyer of all conversations, it seems like. People just switch on the fly what they mean by words, and then, of course, argue with... No, you, argue no, with you. absolutely not. Absolutely not. It is the opposite. It is the only thing that makes conversation possible. Because if you don't define your terms, then people use slick words. The, 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 the neurolinguistic programmers, the warlocks, the witches, use the word incorrectly, or they use the term to refer to two opposite things, or they use a term with a negative connotation to refer to something positive, or they use the word with a positive connotation to refer to something negative. And unless you stop them and say, wait a minute, what exactly do you mean by this word? Then, you, then they get away with murder. And I mean that literally. I mean all the murder in the 20th century could have been avoided if if enough people had asked enough communists, what exactly do you mean by this phrase, wage slavery? What exactly do you mean by this weird, arcane, mystical phrase, uh, uh, dictatorship of the proletariat? What do you mean by this weird, undefined, uh, self, uh, uh, self-refuting 
phrase ideological superstructure. You see the problem? None of those people, of none of the programmers, none of the warlocks we're talking about, the Newspeak guys, Newspeak is designed, Orwellian language is designed to never be defined, to never make it clear what the relationship is between the word and the object. They, they, they say the map is not the territory, but then they say, I'm going to redraw the map to do anything I like. I'm going to draw an ocean where there's a mountain and a mountain where there's an ocean. So you'll go drown. I'm see? just going to be constantly changing the definitions of the words as I want to, and I'm going to argue over definitions. What I see people doing is like running uh, – really, they, they play word games. They change the definition oh, of words. Oh, I know that. I, they I do know that, that all the time. But Forcing yeah. them to define their terms is find their term. stop them from playing word games. No, oh, that's a good point entirely. I agree with you. You do have to force. And that's them why philosophy terms. is boring. Because if you read, uh, let's say Euclid, the first thing he does at the beginning of his math text is he defines all his terms and he uses the terms consistently throughout. See, and now, if your entire philosophy is based on a lie, you can't afford to have that happen. So you have to say reality is what you make of it. Every man creates his own reality. Your truth is not my truth. Okay, all those statements are obvious self-contradictions. If you say reality is what you make, then you go. Then all you have to do is ask the person: Is that statement a real statement? Is it true that there's no such thing as truth? Whether they answer yes or no, they've already cut off the the uh, branch of the tree that they're that they're standing on. Okay, but they say it in order to program people into thinking. There's no point in discussing semantics. There's no point in discussing philosophy. Philosophy is all just this boring, long-winded long word game. And I blame Wittgenstein, by the way, because he's the guy who came up with that idea, that, that philosophy was just a word game, a meaningless word game. No, I don't agree with that at all. I don't agree you don't with think, that at all. You don't I, think Wittgenstein's to blame? Well, I, I, I do wonder sometimes if we made a mistake ever going an inch past Plato and Aristotle. <laughs> Philosophy. As a as a as a devout as a devout Thomist, I will say that uh, uh, Aquinas oh. is the uh, is the summit of Platonic and Aristotelian thinking. But no, we never really have. All all real philosophy is just footnotes to to Plato and Aristotle. The same way all real Eastern philosophy is just footnotes to Confucius and to Lao Tzu. I mean, basically, those two guys established the character of the Chinese psyche. The same way the same way Aristotle and Plato defined what philosophy was supposed to be in the West. So sure. I have no, I have no argument with that. Yeah. I think we went downhill. I think, I think we started to go downhill about Kant, Descartes, and Hume, where people, where so-called philosophers, just started making absurd and, e and easily self, self-defeating statements. You know. I agree. I agree completely. The real question is how to get people to catch on and stop falling for it. And I really do wonder, I mean, this will, this will just be a final philosophical thought. I know it was Aristotle. Uh, I'm speaking broadly, of course, but uh, tended to divide uh, ways of, of having of, of people talking uh, of discourse uh, between uh, dialectic and rhetoric. Um, yes. And I, I actually do wonder if rhetoric isn't really the basis of what we're talking about here. But one of the things he observed, I mean, dialectic, just so anybody knows. Well, is when pardon, you're me, pardon me for interrupting. Let's define our terms. Dialectic is when you have a logical conversation between two points of view to try to establish what the fundamental actions are, what the fundamental conclusions are. And, and rhetoric, you're both is trying to rhetoric, is, rhetoric is ornamental speech. Rhetoric is when you dress up your your arguments in fanciful. Uh, you put you put lipstick on it to make it look prettier. Well, That's yeah, right. discourse is usually an effort by both parties to find the truth, or at least to find where they disagree on the truth. Exactly. Correct. Um, Correct. And, and rhetoric, I, I would say, it, I mean, it can be dressed up, but re rhetoric can use excess and it can use a lot more metaphors and it can use a lot more extremes like you know i can say something like carthage must be destroyed now i may or may not be, mean that literally although maybe that's not the best example because they did actually do that one but you know uh, you know uh poland I, I'll give, I'll you say things that are not literally true I'll give, you you a good, I'll give you a good piece of rhetoric to say the tree of liberty must be watered periodically by the blood of tyrants and patriots. That's a rhetorical statement. Yeah, that's good rhetoric, but you're talking talk all the time about rhetoric. irresponsible rhetoric. Irresponsible I, rhetoric being used uh, to lead men astray. Irresponsible rhetoric being used to lead men astray. Uh, and, and, 
And this yes. is where he gets yep. his ad his reputation for being a, a, a horrible elitist. Um, Ooh, Aristotle. Aristotle, yes, uh, because he also oh, thought that some that 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 many men, maybe the majority, could only think in rhetoric and weren't even capable of dialectic. I I don't <laughs> a serious debate about that. How many people do you know who are scholars or even interested in? philosophy well then 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 we're doomed because basically they're, no, they're, they're we're not doomed we're not doomed because okay. rhetoric can be used correctly as well as abused neurolinguistic programming can be used correctly as well as abused people can be put on their guard against rhetorical tricks you see all that's you see here's here's the, here's the thing there's a, there's a common phrase that's that's been around the uh, the internet recently that says that politics is downstream from culture by which they mean the culture establishes your basic values and worldview, and so your political calculation of what is an effective law or an effective policy is going to spring out of what you think, how you think the world actually works, and what you think is a realistic as opposed to an unrealistic expectation of what a government can do or what a society can do. But the real reality is that culture itself is downstream of cult. It comes from your religion. It comes from your philosophy. It comes from your basic idea of how the world works. Now, in a in a healthy Christian society, you can often have rhetoric that supports things like proper marriage, uh, treating human dignity correctly, and even a free market as much as much as long as you don't abuse that word to mean things that are not free, such as agreements between two governments to to decrease the sovereignty of both nations and put it in the hands of an international body. Just for example, you see, uh, and then you can have of enough of a robust if you believe that the truth is true and you don't think every man creates the truth, if you're not a multiculturalist and you're not a moral relativist or an ethical relativist, then you can actually have a dialogue, a public debate with people, the way they had debates in the Victorian age, very lively debates about all matter, all sorts of matters under the sun. In, in public newspapers, they had them. And now the newspapers would slant to one side or slant to the other because that's, that's the job. That's the way newspapers work. They're, whether they pretend to be objective or not, they... Uh, they're owned by millionaires, so they're gonna they're gonna promote the millionaire point of view, if you see what I'm saying. I, I quite so, agree. There are healthy ways of doing this and unhealthy ways. I I say that the religion, strange as this is to say, is the heart of it. If your religion is healthy, then you can have a healthy culture and therefore a healthy philosophical life. And most people who don't have the brains for being philosophers, but do have the heart for knowing good rhetoric from lies and propaganda will still be on the side of the angel, still be on the right side of things, provided their teachers, their intellectual leaders, and their entertainment, the, the, the schools, the newspapers, the, uh, the, the actors and actresses, if those people are on their side and not against them, and it was that way in the Middle Ages, the, the intellectuals of the Middle Ages were not the enemies of the common people in the Middle Ages. They both believed the same religion. Okay, It wasn't that the common people were all Christians and the intellectuals were all atheists, which is... Which is Sort of what we have nowadays. It's who, therefore, who are at odds with each other? That the, that the people on the coast are uh, all progressive, and the people in the middle of the country are, you know, are guns and guns and Bibles folk. That's not normal. That's 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 the byproduct of an attack of a of an intellectual uh, subversion of an espionage effort to to neurolinguistically program people to have certain responses. If you see what I'm saying, to draw it back to our to our main topic here, people have found out how to scientifically use rhetoric in a way that is extremely subtle and extremely sinister. And even a common man who has no interest in scholarship could could be, be made aware of when he's being manipulated. Most people with commercial ads are, are are bogus. You know. Oh, well, I know. know. So, I know. But then I don't know. Sometimes but, people just. But most people still believe the, the mainstream news, which I think is outrageous because the mainstream news is, is been caught with its pants down lying actually, so many times. Actually, well, it's right. There's a really weird disconnect there, and we should be closing this up soon because we're coming up on our hour. But it is amazing to me how uh, actually surveys show that a majority, something like 80% of the American people, no longer finds the mainstream news trustworthy. <laughs> it, it's ridiculously high. It's just that high. And yet they still routinely believe things they believe in it. And I no longer do. You know, I mean, I look at any given story they show, and other than okay, I assume the weather's probably right. I assume the sports scores are probably correct. Um, man, back when I worked for the newspaper, the sports pages were still 
clean because they didn't have an axe to grind. But that's changed in the last few years. Yeah. And nowadays they'll they'll hold they'll talk about sports for a while, but then they'll suddenly hold forth on something like whether you kneel or stand for the national anthem. Oh and God, it's for they're not on our side, you know. You see. Now that also is an example of neurolinguistic programming. Because if you think if, if you associate the kneeling, both the act is purely symbolic, okay? If you associate the kneeling with disrespect for the flag and for the men who bled for that flag, you're deeply offended. If you, but on the other hand, if you if you associate the kneeling with the bravery of someone who wishes to oppose police brutality in our fascist culture, your heart soars like a hawk. You think that guy's a hero, okay? Now, what's the difference between those two emotional reactions? Programming. Programming. Hypnosis. How you Hypnosis. Chose, how you chose to and yep. How you were led to inter not just how you chose to interpret it, how you were led to interpret it by who you yeah. found persuasive. All right, tell you what, why don't we go ahead and wrap this up? We'll be back next Monday, I'm sure, um, to talk about the usual good stuff. Uh, tomorrow night, I'm not sure what we have up. On Wednesday, we're going to have a couple of flat earthers in, so that should be fun. You can all bring your hardest questions for them. It should be a uh, amusing uh we have stuff going on here every night so please do be sure to give us a like please give us a subscribe please tell your friends or enemies and please visit us on redpillreligion.com and hit that tip jar or buy some stuff and be sure to visit sci-fi-right.com and buy his stuff too and uh god bless everybody god bless gentlemen ladies